So why don't you guys read it carefully after you read it and tell me which scenario does it fall into? Does it fall into the goodness of fit test, uh, which means comparing multiple population proportions, or we are working on a, a test of independence, right? You want to read it carefully, read it. So are we working on a test of independence? Um, or is this a comparing multiple population proportions? Multiple what do you think? population proportions. Okay, so multiple population proportions. Uh, do you all agree with that? You can use a thumbs up or some. Is this a compare multiple population proportion? Great, great. Okay. Uh, well, I hope other students are thinking with us uh, clearly as well. Okay. So they're, uh, they were talking about most um, popular best selling five compact cars. And uh, do any of your family actually drive this kind of uh, the, one of those five cars? It's supposed to be really popular, right? Okay, so you know those are common Chevy Cruze, Ford Focus, let's see, uh, Hyundai, uh, Hyundai Elantra, Honda Civic, and Toyota Corolla, right? Okay, okay, good. So uh, I'm going to ask you several questions because we all agree this compared multiple populations. So what is the K here? What is the number of a population? Five. You can use it. Five, right? Okay, great. Five. Okay, and uh, let's see. So. Uh, Five population. Okay, great. And uh, so, what are those here? What are the numbers here? What are those numbers here? So, you took a sample of 400 car sales. So, this is your sample, right? This is your sample. And what are those numbers here? The number of cars sold in that sample uh, for Portland. Yes, that's, that's right. So, uh, those are counts, right? Or maybe frequency, right? Would you agree with me? Frequency. And uh, Let's, let's continue, okay. So what we have here is we want to use the goodness of fit to determine whether the sample indicate the market shares of five cars. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I changed the question. I did not change every one of them. This is uh, awkward, okay. So this should be Portland. I thought I changed everything to Portland. It should be the same. Do you guys see Portland somewhere here? Oh, yes, okay. Well, my bad. Okay, so this one should be Portland. I try to make it more relevant to us, and so I change it. Okay, should be Portland. Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to see the sample data indicate market shares for the five cars in Portland are different than the market shares reported by Model Trend. So what does the Model Trend tell us? Model Trend thinks Chevy Cruze should be 24%, Focus should be 21%, and Hyundai Elantra should be 20%, uh, Honda Civic should be 18 right? Okay, and uh, clearly this is a hypothesis test. How do I know? It's because this is a goodness of fit test. And if you want to be uh, more specific about that is uh, we are not doing any kind of a hypothesis test. This is a clearly a chi-square test because, because k is 5, which is more than 2. So you can use the uh, two population case we discussed last week. You have to set up the table. Okay. So the first thing is we have to set up the null and alternative. So the null and alternative are given here. Okay. So how how am I going to write out the null and alternative? So uh, so the null actually says I'm going to use the rule I just told you. There is no relation. There is no relationship like a, a relationship which is different from the specified relationship by modal modal trend. So you know they are the same. That that's what I'm trying to say. So according to modal trend. Chevy Cruze, do we know what the population proportion for Chevy Cruze then, according to model trend? Yes, do we know that? Is that the 24%? 24%, right, okay, so that's right, it should be 24%, okay, so I'm gonna write it down here, it's 24%. Okay, and for focus is 21, and here on the Elantra is 0.20, and this is 0.7. And uh, so one rule of thumb I'm going to tell you is whenever you are dealing with those different pro uh, population pro probabilities, you do want to add up those five, whatever numbers you have, to make sure they sum up to one. This is important. So what I have here, I have a P1, which is 24%. I add a P2, P3. You do want to add up to all of them to make sure it is one. This is very, very important, right? You have K population, population, uh, populations here. You do want to make 
add up the population pro, uh, population probabilities. Okay, and uh, we're gonna use this table. You know, uh, you know, uh, alternative sorry, alternative hypothesis should be they are not equal to pre-specified probability. That means is uh, Chevy Cruz is probably different from 24%. This is maybe different from 21%. That's what we were talking about early on. You don't need all of them to be different from those five probabilities. You just need one of them to be different. Okay, and then that means that null doesn't hold. It's gonna be the alternative. Okay, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna fill up this table because it's gonna help us to determine this uh, test statistic. And you know, right now here, the test statistic is right here, right? So this is our test statistic. Okay, so let's take a look. So uh, earlier on I asked you guys, what are those numbers? Those are what you observed in your data. And what is the total number of a uh, sample size you have here? How many cars did they pick in Portland? They picked the 400, right? Okay, so if you add up those, four num uh, those five numbers, it should also give you 400, right? You can double check. Okay, so those are observed frequency. Make sure those are counts as what we have here. Those are counts. Okay, we're gonna move on to calculate expected frequency. Okay, and maybe some of you are gonna help me to calculate it. How would you calculate the first one? How would you calculate the very first one? How would you do it? All we have here is the, the probabilities. And this probabilities means if the null is true, Motor trend we expect the Chevy Cruze is 24% you know, uh, of the uh, compact cars will be Chevy Cruze. And if the null is true, motor trend we expect 21% of the uh, cars will be fall focus. So those are the expected, uh, sorry, expected probabilities. Based on the expected probabilities, how would you calculate expected frequencies then? How would you calculate it? I mean, we don't have that information, right? We only have expected probabilities. How would I convert it to, uh, to frequency? Multiply Anybody wants to the sample size? I'm gonna use the sample size, yes. What is the sample size? I know it is 400, but how is that gonna help me? You multiply the uh, expected 0.24 of the Chevy Cruze times 400. 24%, right? That's a so you can do that, and that's going to give you 96. The next one is going to be 400 multiplied by 21. You do that, that's going to give you 84. You can do the same thing, which I'm going to write it out, the numbers. And one thing that you guys have to check whenever you, you set up this table, you do want to make sure those five numbers add up to 400 as well. If they don't, that means you probably made some mistakes here. Or maybe there's some wrong issue because you're not getting 400. Okay, the total expected, total expected count frequency is here should be the same as the sum of the observed frequency. Okay, because we only have five populations, nothing else, just five populations, right? Okay, and then you're gonna find this one. I mean, just gonna do one demonstration for you in case you, you're not sure how to do that. So FO minus FE, FO is right here, FE is 96, 100 minus 96. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. If you do that, that's going to give you 1.5, right? You can do the same thing for every one of them, which I'm going to just write it out here. Remember, my answers are also going to typically post it on, uh, on Canvas right after class. Okay, so as you can see, we have all those numbers up and our final task here. Oh, sorry. Okay, so once we have all of those, you know, sum them up, and that's gonna give us 11.2266. I'm gonna write down here, and this number is super important. So the only reason we set up this table is to find this number, and that's the final answer we need. This is gonna be the 2011, uh, this is gonna be our test statistic. Is why this didn't you, yes? yes. Uh, why didn't you add 11.226 to 800? Isn't that supposed to be your grand total? Okay, good. Good question, Jackson. Okay, so um, so you probably remember there's grand total for the second table, right, for this time. But this table is only uh, applicable for tests of independence. Okay, I want to emphasize here. Okay, so the numbers given here, okay, if you watch the video, so for each cell, for this particular cell, I'm going to have a two different number, FO 
And also FE in the slides, and I represent them one, with one of the number in bracket, in bracket to differentiate them. So you have a two numbers here. And so these two numbers are some sort of equivalent to the two numbers we observe here and here. Okay, so the grand total is only applicable for tests of independence. This table is actually very different from what we have here because if you look carefully, for each column, it represents your color preference. Whereas for this table, what we have here is observed frequency versus expected frequency. There's only one type of classification here. It depends on which car they drive, you know, whether it's Chevy or it's a Ford. Gotcha, thank you. Okay, so it is different. Okay, I'm glad you brought it up. I'm sure you know a lot of other students are probably having the same question, but uh, they didn't ask. But you can see. Okay, so the test statistic is just summing up those test statistics. It has nothing to do with expected and observed because you have already used all those information when you try to calculate those ratios. You have already used the information, right? Okay, so this is the test statistic. Any other questions? Excellent, excellent. Any other questions from you guys? Okay, if not, okay. So how about the degree of freedom? So we have to calculate the degrees of freedom as well. So the degrees of freedom for this particular example, the case, the goodness of fit test is K minus one. We have five brands of cars. That's gonna be five minus one, that's four, right? That's four. And we have to, we have to find the P value and also the critical value. I'm gonna go slowly to tell you how this, you know, uh, to explain how this can be found, especially because this is the first time we talk about chi-square test, right? Okay, so for chi-square test, I'm gonna draw it out, okay. So Z, tape, Z distribution and T distribution, they typically follow this bell curve, which is symmetric. So the key here, it is always symmetric. Okay, so this for Z or T, I'm gonna ask you several questions. So what is the center of this uh, bell curve? What is the center? Is it one, two? Zero. Zero? Me? It could so be me. zero, it could also me, right? They are the same, they are equivalent, just different ways of, zero I'm gonna write it down Z. here. Z, Z, you're absolutely right, me or zero, right? So the key is a Z distribution, T distribution, they are symmetric, they are symmetric. This is super important. Okay, I'm gonna, on the other hand side, okay, chi-square distribution is not symmetric. Very, very important, not a symmetric. Okay, I mean, uh, I have to erase here, okay. How do I know it is not a, a metric? Okay, if you guys have already uh, look up the tables. Okay, so this is the Z, uh, Z table. And uh, we also learned the T table as well. There's a degrees of freedom as you can probably see degrees of freedom, okay. And if you go further, the next table, the table three, uh, table three, I'm gonna go a little bit here. Table three is for chi-square distribution. This is not symmetric. This is not symmetric. I'm gonna ask you, what is the center of this uh, chi-square distribution? So this is a chi-square distribution, it's a chi-square. And typically the degrees of freedom is given here. For example, if say the degrees of freedom is five, you can write this, as a chi-square five, right? So this is what we typically do. We're gonna put the degrees of freedom uh, right here. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you one question. What is the center right here? What is the center? Yes, what is the center? This is a trick question. We actually don't know what the center is. It's very difficult to figure out where the center is, right? Impossible, so we don't know the center. Okay, but there's something we know of, okay. What is the starting point here? What is the starting point right here? What is it? So the chi-square distribution, the chi-square test statistic, or maybe the test statistic, chi-square score, is gonna be somewhere here. So what is the lowest, or maybe the smallest chi-square score you can have here? Zero. Okay, so Benjamin said a zero, and this is right, but how, why do you think it's a zero? Benjamin, why did you say it's a zero? Can chi-square, or maybe chi-square test statistic be negative? Is it possible? No. Why not? You're right, but why not? Okay, there's a way to think about it. Okay, so let's take a look. So chi-square can be written out as a, this something. Okay, so this is a sum. Let's take a closer look. So it's gonna be add up a bunch of numbers. And a bunch of numbers is all square term. 
So square term means the first term is going to be at least more than zero. The second one is also at least more than zero. If you do add up a bunch of uh, positive numbers or maybe non-negative number, the chi-square test of this has to be at least zero as well, right? So chi-square score cannot be less than zero. Okay, any questions on this part? Is it clear? It cannot be negative because actually when we try to set up this distribution, we use a square term. This is not, you know, not by random chance. You know, we were, you know, it, there's some reason behind it. We have to find the positive counterpart of it. We have to square it. So that's why if we were drawing the call, oh, sorry, Kai, square distribute, oh, not this one, okay. So it has to be at least a zero. So that means all the numbers are positive. So they are all positive here, all positive, right? Okay. So I'm going to tell you what exactly does a chi-square distribution tell us? Okay, if you think carefully, what we were doing when we try to set up a chi-square distribution, we were trying to compare what we observed versus what we expected, right? We were trying to find their difference. So we were trying to set up the observed versus expected. And chi-square test statistic actually sums up the difference between them. Okay, so that means if there's a huge difference between observed and expected, the chi-square test statistic, it's gonna be probably very big, very big. If there's a very difference between the observed and expected, the chi-square test statistic is gonna be very small. And it couldn't be anything smaller than the zero. So that's why I'm gonna write out something very, very important, very, very important. Okay, so if your chi-square test statistic is positive, that means it's, it's along the very right-hand side of this, that means there's a, there's a huge difference between observed and expected. If there's a huge difference between observed and expected, what does it say about our null and alternative? If there's a huge difference between what we observed versus what expected, what does it say about a null and alternative? Does it mean there's a stronger evidence to support a null or maybe against a null. If there's a huge difference between what we observed versus what expected, does it mean there's a huge support, there's a stronger support, uh, sorry, there's a stronger evidence to support a null or maybe against a null. If the observed is very different from expected, that means the data follows the null or maybe it doesn't follow the null. If there's a huge difference between them, that means your, pro your data probably doesn't follow what you expected, right? Right, okay, I hope this is part clear. If there's a huge difference between what you observed versus what you expected, that means your data probably doesn't follow your expected distribution. That means there's a huge, huge evidence to against the null, against the null, right? That means the data doesn't follow the null distribution because it's different from what you expected. Right, okay, so let's take, let's, let's write it out. Okay, if the chi-square test statistic is huge, that means there's a strong evidence against a null. Okay, so I'm gonna write it down here. Strong evidence to support, oh, sorry, sorry to, to against, to against this part. Okay, is this part clear? If there's, a, if the test statistic is a huge, that means there's a, the, there's a huge difference between what we observed versus what we expected. And that means the data doesn't support a null, a null hypothesis. So that's why there's a strong evidence to against a null. It doesn't support it. It's a huge difference. It doesn't support it. So it should be against it. Okay. So on the other hand side, if the chi-square chi or test statistic is very, very small, is very, very small means it's very close to zero. That means there's a strong evidence to support the null, to support the null. Is this part clear what I'm saying? So if you do get a huge chi-square test statistic, that means you probably have a lot of evidence to against it, so you should reject it. If you have a very small chi-square test statistic, that means there's a lot of evidence to support it. You should fail to reject the null. Okay, is this part clear? Raise your hand if, uh, if it's clear. So uh, if not, uh, I'm gonna go over it again. Okay, okay, great, great. I know this part is a little bit tricky and so that's why, okay, so let's take a look. So as far as the chi-square test statistic is concerned, uh, it's a chi-square distribution is a concern. It's very much like a, a T-distribution. Again, it's sorted by degrees of freedom. 
Okay. And just so you can see, this is what we have is a big table. It's 100. Anything beyond 100, you should use the last row, right? Okay. And uh, it's also upper tail. This is very much like a T test, this T distribution. Okay, I'm gonna use the example we were working on. The test statistic we got is 11 point something. So let's take a look. The test statistic we get is 11.22. The degrees of freedom is four. Okay. So degrees of freedom is four. I'm looking for 11.22. 11.22 is between those two, as you can see. So this means, okay, our observation, I mean, right down here, this is our 11.2 here. So our, our probability, our tail, upper tail probability is gonna be between 2.5% and also 1%. So that means this corner right here, upper the probability, which is also the p-value for our case, that's gonna be between 2.5 versus 1%. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to what we have here. I'm gonna draw this diagram again. Okay, so this is a zero. This is a positive and a chi square. Okay, this is a chi square five, chi square five. And our test statistic is 11.2266. Okay, I'm gonna find the p-value first. P value is just this upper tail here. This is our P value. And uh, from the table, we just know this is gonna be between 0.025 and 0.01, right? Okay, so those are gonna be the numbers here. I'm gonna write down here. Okay, so it's gonna be between 0.01 and I like to write a smaller number first. Okay, so this is our P value fairly small, but how do we know how small is gonna be considered really small? We are gonna compare with the significance level, which is given to be 5%, right? 5%, okay, so we can write it out here. Okay, so this is less than alpha. This is less than alpha. So what would you do if you receive a very small p-value? What would you typically do if you have a very small p-value? Do you reject it now or do you fail to reject? You reject, right? You only reject if the p-value is super small, it's smaller than alpha. Okay, so I'm gonna write it down here. You are going to reject the null. Okay, and this shouldn't be surprising to you because I have already said earlier today, if you lie really far away to the right-hand side, a very big number, that means you have a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence against the null, so you are gonna reject the null. If you have a, a very small chi-square test statistic, you're gonna fail to reject, right? Fail to reject. Could you also help me to figure out what the critical value is? What is the critical value? Okay, why don't you guys give it a try and tell me what the critical value is? How would you figure out the critical value? What is the critical value? So you have to figure out the degrees of freedom, which is the same, right? Which is four. So how would you figure out the critical value? What is the critical value at alpha equals to 5%? Are you guys working with me here? 0.9488. Okay, so uh, Ben said, uh, Benjamin said 9.588. Would you all agree? Is it 9.488? Do you think it's 9.488? Yes, right it is, right? You're gonna look up alpha equals to 5%, which is right here. You're gonna read up uh, degrees of freedom, which is four. So it is 9.488, 9.488. Any questions on this part? You guys look really super confused, super confused. Maybe I didn't explain. Okay, I'm gonna write down here, the critical value is right here. So the CV 9.488. Okay, as you can see, our our test statistic lies on the right-hand side of this critical value, critical value, so you are gonna reject. Okay, as far as a chi-square test is concerned, this is super important, I'm gonna go back to the notes I was making. As far as a chi-square test is concerned, okay, you are always performing, you are always performing an upper tail test. Always a upper tail test. The reason is because uh, the reason is because chi-square is not, chi-square test is not symmetric, chi-square distribution is not symmetric, it's always positive. 
So it's always an upper tail test. Always upper tail test. You, play, you probably remember if you're doing an upper tail test, if the test statistic is, on the, is even bigger than critical value, you will reject, right? If it's bigger than critical value, you're gonna reject. That's exactly the case we have here. So the test statistic is bigger than the critical value. Again, you're gonna reject. Okay, I'm gonna fill in the here. Thus, we enough evidence to conclude market shares for in, it should be Portland are different than those reporting by motor trend. So do we have enough evidence or we do not have enough evidence to conclude? Do we have enough evidence to conclude uh, market shares are different or not? We do have enough evidence, right? We do have enough evidence. Okay, so that means a different, uh, the market shares for five compact cars in Portland are probably different from those reported by Model Trend. And uh, okay, and uh, this market share, so there's uh, another typo here. So please help me to market share. This market share for five cars are, okay, so the market shares are, are not uh, those uh, 24%, 21%, 20%, oh, not sure. 18 and 70. They are not. Okay, they are not. Okay, the tricky part is we don't know whether P1 is not 24% all, P4 not 18%. We don't know, but we know at least one of them is different from those numbers specified here at least one of them. We just need a one to reject the null because the null says exactly those five fall into this probability. But our data says they are not true. This statement is not true. So we just need one of them to be different from those five probabilities to contradict it. So that's the key. You just need one of them.